I have the great privilege to be up here today with J.J. Abrams and Katie McGrath. They are obviously the, some of the greatest storytellers of our time. Uh, one of the things I think about is the people in this room are the makers and funders of the problems and opportunities we choose to solve in the tech world. They put the stuff on the, the, the screen, big, little, and even littler, that kind of tell us who we are and who we want to be. There's a tremendous amount of power in that. What you guys may not know is that their work extends into many other areas from gaming to nonprofits to starting movements. So um, excited to hit a bunch of topics today. Um, I want to kind of start off by creating some context for you guys, your partnership, Bad Robot as a company. Maybe um, walk us through as you guys moved into creating Bad Robot, what are some of the things you thought about to kind of, I don't know, productize creativity in a world where it often looks like magic to this audience? We know that a lot goes on behind the scenes. You know, give us some background. You want to start? You start. You start. You start. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having us here, and thank you all. Um, the truth is, when I, when I started Bad Robot, and, and I started it before we started it, which is to say, it wasn't really a thing, and I have very little information about how to run a company and what is necessary to do that, to, make, to be productive at scale. And so I, I, I began Bad Robot because I had to. We were doing a show called Alias a long time ago, and I needed to come up with a logo, and it, so it started off as a, as a legal necessity. And then I was working until two in the morning, and someone suggested, you know, you could do a production deal. And I had never thought about it. And then we started to put together a very, very small group of people, and it just was a way of, of knowing I wanted to maximize the potential that I thought existed in the relationships that I had, people who I knew were, you know, writers and directors and actors who wanted to do things and there's only so much time in the day and I thought if we had a team we could actually do a couple more things a few more things once we started the company proper and had our bought our building and began to put it together it soon became clear to Katie who then made it clear to me it wasn't being run any way near as it should and that's when we started working together actively to actually create a company um, and look, the, the, the answer to your question ultimately is finding the right people with whom to work, who you, re you can rely on, who deserve to be there to do the great work, who can then hire w and work with people who also are, should be there and are worthy. And it's, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's a bit obvious, maybe, and boring to talk about, but it, it didn't begin with a vision. It began with a kind of, you know, doing it because I was told we needed to do it. And it soon became something that was this, you know, this exciting passion of how do we, how do we scale it? And, and, and it's not just creative, it's the culture of the company. And that was where, you know, in working together, I think we've been able to create something that I'm really proud to be a part of. And maybe, Katie, jump in and talk about it. I mean, I think one of the things that's really special about you guys are your collaboration and your partnership. And we live in this world where the Elons and the Zucks of the world, the creators in our industry, they're not just celebrated and romanticized, they're compensated very differently than maybe the builders and the operators who help take it from small to big. Um, would love to hear, I don't know, maybe how you do it, words of inspiration to have people, th how do you think about building a high performance team where you find this kind of partnership? And candidly, for those of us who know Katie, you know, we know that the, the E in Katie's title is very powerful in the industry, but you're also behind the scenes. And is that an overt choice? Um, do you feel a responsibility for your role to be more romanticized in the world now that, you know, we hope more people find collaborators like a Katie McGrath? Um, so take it and go with it wherever you'd like. Got it. <laughs> um, so I would say that, you know, in any partnership, and we obviously are partnered across a couple of different platforms. We're married, we're parents. The marriage platform. The marriage platform. <laughs> it's a VC crowd platforms. Um, and obviously, we're partners in, uh, in our company and in the business. And regardless of how many of those boxes you check, I think that the most important thing is that you share the same North Star, that you share the same definition of what value is. And so for us, you know, we are a constant feedback loop with each other of the places where we are being true to that. And when one of us is off course, you know, we can quickly, um, you know, readjust. I think when we think about building our teams too, it's, it's the same way. 
every leader in our team and every, every employee all the way down to our dishwasher who is one of the most incredible parts of our entire team have to all kind of be rowing in the same direction. So that's I think the most important thing in a, in a partnership. The other thing for, um, for me I would say when you speak to the point about like the public facing or you know the internal facing profile I had JJ answer the first question because he started the company. You know, obviously this is not, um, Bad Robot is based on the things that he has made and seen and the people with whom he's gotten to bring stories to life. My role is, you know, is very happily the one that it is, which is heavily internal facing because I don't think what we do as a company externally will be meaningful if we actually aren't grounding ourselves constantly in what our North Star is, what we care about, how we leverage you know, our values and our ethics against the opportunity um, that we have to scale reaching global audiences ultimately. So you know, I don't want to be in the background because I'm afraid of being in the foreground. It's just, it's terribly uninteresting to me. And I, I you know, and, and by the way, we don't need it. Like, yeah. It's okay in a partnership to fit as puzzle pieces do together, and I don't think same same has ever really been a great benefit. So the title co CEO inspires fear in the hearts of venture capitalists. Um, how do you guys make hiring decisions, and who wins? Uh, Katie wins. <laughs> uh, as you can tell, Katie wins. Uh, no, I think that the if I can just do, yeah, because this is uh, you know as you were talking about trust, I, I almost can't imagine what it would be like to try and run any company in any other way. And this is the only time I've experienced this. Uh, I think of the things that we've gone through over the years just as parents, you know, like as anyone who's married probably knows, you walk into the room, your spouse is in an argument with one of the kids you are instantly aligned with that partner, with your, with your spouse. Like, you, you know, you don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> you know, you, you just walk into the kitchen, you're like, whoosh, yeah, you should make sure that you're, you know, you're suddenly like on their side. And that, that kind of stuff has happened so many times. And there have been situations at the office where, you know, I don't see a lot of this stuff. And y you are always picking up on and you smell smoke a million miles away. And when I hear you say, this is a problem, I know it's a problem. And it's usually a problem before it's a problem. It's, it's gonna be a problem, because you're so good at that. And so I think that the trust issue is just, is, is enormous. And I, I just, I think that it's, you know, the fact that we live at home the way we do at the office, it's like there isn't any kind of change. It's all yeah. kind of one thing. But I think that the trust thing and really believing and, he, and having a partner who will tell you the bad news. You know, having someone who will say to you, this isn't good enough, this isn't working, you're doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. I mean, and that is like, I, I don't know, you know, it, what it would be like to be doing, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be working. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it's a, it's a huge. So we have a, a bunch of other things to hit. We're going to move on. One last quick question. Um, if there are tech CEOs in the audience, what would you t tell them to inspire them to give away half of their company to their Katie? Uh, well, I would say that the, the, the company was, became what it, what it, what it is. It, it's, it's, it's still evolving. We're always figuring it out. We're always making mistakes. We're, we're, we're as it's evolving. But it wouldn't be what it is if it weren't, I think, for the two of us. And I, I, don't, I don't look at it that way. What, the way I look at it is if, if you can find the person, <laughs> ideally you marry them, <laughs> then you start the company. But, but, but if, if you have that partner that you, that you do trust and I guess on some level really do love and appreciate because they're willing to tell you the tough stuff, and they're smart enough to know and, and really examine the truth um, and have that kind of compass. Uh, it, 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 what it becomes is so much more valuable than it ever would have been if you were just the creator alone or just the, you know, the one person. And I think it's, it's, it is a bit of a, a divide and conquer job. And I think that's, by the way, one of the reasons that we work well together is because we each appreciate what the other one does well and gives each other that kind of space and is always willing to make a comment and be respect each other's opinions. Yeah. No, I think that resonates. And, and I, I actually said to my partner, Mark, recently, I think our partnership has a lot of love. 
and partnerships are the most unnatural structure, power structures that exist in the world. And um, so you guys look for, your, look for love in your venture capital firm too. Um, okay, so shifting gears, um, Katie, what do you think is the most influential to you, like piece of work that you guys have put out in the world um, in your time doing this? I didn't prep this question. So it depends what you, again, what how, you, you, how you define you, influence. Yeah, your, um, your, your definition. So for me, and this is just my perspective, it, there's no measurement behind it. I think when um, JJ was invited to direct The Force Awakens, that was something that the entire company and obviously the production and the crew took very seriously as an opportunity and a privilege to know that there was going to be a global audience in a way that no other title that um, or project he'd worked on, you know, had the same scale. Um, and so the way, and I will, you know, I obviously have an influence and I have a voice. Um, and in the earliest stages, I think we did talk about if we have this moment, this privilege, what do we want to do with it? And not from a place of being preachy or feeding people spinach, but it, just from a place of this. Anytime you have a privilege, you have an obligation, period. That's just kind of how we try to live our lives. And so in this case, I think the way, and I let JJ speak to this more specifically, that he thought about building this story with a female protagonist, with um, you know, a set of four you know, main characters, one of whom was you know, um, Latinx, one of whom was um, you know, a, a Nigerian, Londoner, uh, one of whom was a woman, a white woman, and then there was a white guy. And we, we, we still have room for white men, and we love the white men still. Um, but, you know, it was really to think about how can we find a way to have every kid who's going to go see that movie see a version of themselves in a way that, you know, just isn't often considered at scale. Do you want to think about that? Uh, nope. But no, I, I, I agree with you, and um, my answer is sort of coming at it, um, and I know it's not bad robot proper, but watching what's happened with Time's Up um, has been so incredible to me. Um, this, this movement that began, you know, with a bunch of people, including Katie, in and around uh, the work that we've been doing, and just seeing seeing in, you know, in really you know, tangible, quantifiable, important ways how it's affected people's lives, uh, the way they see themselves, the way they speak up, and, and you know, having a confidence to do so, knowing they're not alone, uh, to me is wildly impressive. And also uh, within Bad Robot itself, which is sort of small, just seeing the impact of the culture of the company. Uh, and, and I think that ultimately does resonate in the work that we do. Yeah. So first of all, thank you guys. Um, see it, be it, and you guys give us an opportunity to aspire to be better in all those ways. But um, I, I mean, talking about Star Wars, first of all, I'm just curious. Um, you take on an epic franchise like that in our incredibly polarized world, where they're just the middle seems gone, right? And there's love and there's hate. First of all, how do you even approach telling that story in this world? Um, maybe you just, you know, that's one. And then. We can talk about how you handle the critical acclaim or not afterwards, but why don't we start with the first question? You know, it's uh, <clears throat> being in, involved in, in Star Wars, uh, it's, it's been such a, a, a blessing and, and I'm, I feel incredibly honored to have been part of it. I think every project that you work on, um, and I'm sure that everyone in this room or tent, let's be specific, it's a tent, <laughs> I, I think everyone here knows that you know you get a, a you have a project you have an opportunity, and uh, my guess is that everyone is in this room because we all have big eyes. There's a sense of uh, audacity that we can pull something off, um, and there are the realities of the situation, whatever it is, the the the, the context in which you say I'm going to try and tackle this. Um, like everything, it's a team effort. And you go into every project, and, and Star Wars is, is no different, really, um, doing the best you can with everything that you have. A lot of it is in your control. A lot of it's not in your control. You have a ton of 
you know, if you're lucky, uh, you have people that you're working with, uh, in the case of Star Wars, literally if you watch the end credits of those movies, uh, they're still running. I mean, the, the number of people in the end credits, it's, and, it, and each of those is a person who spent many hours away from their family to participate in this thing and, and, and help it. But you've got people who you can rely on, uh, who give you comfort, who make you feel like I'm not in this alone. Um, it's obviously uh, when projects work and it, they touch people and people react in a way that you were hoping, because all we're doing uh, while trying to be aware of the context in which the films and shows come out, we're just, just trying to entertain people. Uh, we will bring our values as much as we can, not preaching, but we'll bring them to the projects. But the truth is that these are things that, that are meant to entertain people, to make them feel something and, and hopefully feel good. Um, obviously, it doesn't always work. It's, it's hard when it doesn't. And when it doesn't, you have to understand it. You have to acknowledge it. And you have to, you have to examine it. And I think that the, you know, if you don't take the time to really stop and not just necessarily privately, but even with the pe people you're working with, and, and try and, and interrogate it and get to some clarity. It doesn't need to be an epiphany. It doesn't need to be like, from now on, I'm going to. And, and because I'm naturally a fairly impatient person, and I want things to kind of be moving forward, like intellectually, I know. I'm going to go on for one more second about this. I know I'm talking for too long. Intellectually, I know we all agree on certain things. Like, Sometimes limitations are actually helpful because they, they, they force you to be more creative. Being told no, we all want to be told no, you know, because we want to, we want to make sure that we're like being checked and that we're, we're getting the best of people. But the truth is, hearing no hurts. Hearing you're not doing a good enough job is painful. Um, uh, when, you're, you know, when you're told no, you don't have the money or the resources you were expecting, it sucks. Because you want, but those things, those difficult things are what makes us grow and what allows us to actually consider and reconsider process. And, and that to me is invaluable. So I, I, I just feel like, you know, no one wants any project not to work, but when it doesn't, you have to, you know, try and figure out, well, maybe there's, maybe I shouldn't say yes to something if I know that the context doesn't, you know, you have to argue with your hubris, you know. Um, and when things work and it's extraordinary and people have a, a reaction that you were hoping for or a series that literally, when we were doing Lost, I, I got a phone call from the head of ABC who said, um, while we were shooting the pilot, and he said, please film an ending so we could air it as a movie on, you know, on the network. And I was like, but film a scene that ends the pilot and make it a, a what, tell me what you want me to shoot and I'll shoot it. And I never heard back and we didn't have to do that. And then they aired it as a series and it worked. And when it worked, it was this extraordinary thing that this ridiculous thing that Damon Lindelof and I had come up with in, in a crazy short amount of time actually meant something to some people. It was thrilling. So it's, it's the fun of it working and the kind of fear that it might not it's all part of the same process. Yeah, I think that probably resonates with a lot of founders in the room who want to raise a $15 million Series A round and only raise a $7 million Series A round. So uh, capital constraints and fear um, are powerful if you're mm. not afraid to, to, for it not to work. Um, so, um, you know, I, one of the things I wanted to hit on with you guys is, is sort of the world's changed a lot since you started your company. Um, you had many fewer screens and lost kind of, you know, it, it's potential, you could argue it's most influential show to have gone on to television because this whole cu culture, you probably would like to argue about that, but we're not going to. Um, the, the whole culture of water cooler and in between and multiple screens kind of came out of it. Um, what, how do you guys think about what you produce for today? What is product? What is marketing? What is content? What is gaming? Like, how do you think about that from a business standpoint? I'll start. I, I think the first thing you can't think about it, like in our business, is the product. Um, though I know that's the common kind of unit maybe for this crowd, but I, you know, and again, I, I think JJ should speak to this, but you have to fall in love with something first, and you have to, you have to decide that, you know, the thing that you're going to risk pursuing is going to keep you interested and excited and if you do fall in love then I do 
you know, and you can't control for all the variables, that builds momentum and that informs, I think, a lot of the way you think about talking about it, the way you market it, the way that you plan for it. But at the very beginning, the core of it has to be something that's undeniable. At least that's, you know, how we think about it at our company. So as you get into things like gaming, mm -hmm. when do you decide to do something in gaming versus just to put it, you know, on, you know, a more traditional screen? Well, our gaming company is separate from our company. Um, and we aren't looking at it like that because I think, and again, you know, jump in, babe, here, but the, the idea needs to come first. And then it's an idea, then the next question is where does it live best? Um, and there are crossovers all the time. There's a TV show that then, oh, we can exploit it through a game or we can exploit it through a short form or maybe that becomes a film. That's not the question. It's a question eventually, but that, has, that comes down after you've found success with the thing that you are pursuing and in love with. Um, and in, we have a games team that is constantly developing in the way our television and our films teams are. So I think across these different you know, parts of our company, everyone's operating from that same principle. Ooh, what would be fun? And then you know, down the line with success, you figure out ways to exploit it. I, I think that, that, that is, is all true. I think that the, the question really is what's the, the mothership? What's the th the, what is the thing that you're doing? And if the project is a film uh, or a series, the, the work that needs to get done in that is typically so focused and so intense that the idea of what is the ancillary product, what is the marketing you know, piece that we need, what is the, and, and as we've all seen, any of us who, who are gamers uh, know that most games that come from films or, or, or series don't work feel like they're kind of corporate choices and, and ultimately sort of attempts at a, a, a cast grab and exploiting a, an IP as opposed to something that had its own heartbeat. And at the end of the day, the, the, the people are making it. So as long as you have a person or people who are behind something and, and they're worthy of the job, uh, you know, then the thing has a shot. It's when someone is, is taking it as a job or a mandate to make a game based on that thing or a short form or whatever it is, it's, it's almost never, ever, ever going to work. And I, I think that the, one of the issues that we've had at the company until now, we've just signed a deal with, with uh, Warner Media and um, their uh, you know, minority investor in, in the gaming company as well, that we now have an opportunity to not work siloed. We used to have a TV deal at Warner's and a feature deal at another studio, but now we're all under sort of one uh, uh, roof. So the uh, opportunity, whether it's in music, in games, TV, film, to be able to you know, have people hearing at the very early stages what's happening. Often music is a reactive thing. You know, a, a, a movie is written, scenes are cut, and then music is placed. But to have music early on, there are some people, this director, Tom Tickfer, who's a German director, he, liked, he actually writes and then records with the full orchestra his, his scores before he shoots. Doesn't always need to happen, doesn't always work, but that the, the idea of having music actually influence in a positive way the creative process or, or sometimes visual effects or, or design, production design. So we're trying to, within the different divisions, find the heartbeats of different projects so that if something does feel like that could coexist as a game for those worthy projects, to allow the thing to kind of split and become twins or triplets and not just have it be, you know, a single. By the way, that is apparently how the best champagne is made in France. Well, that was my they, point. They, <laughs> what? What do you mean? <laughs> they, they pick their soundtrack while they're making their champagne. Is that right? Well, Part of their creative process. Okay. Really? Um, so I want to hit one, <laughs> one last big important topic before we go, which is, um, so Katie's one of the co-founders of Time's Up. Um, one of the many, many co-founders. One of the many, many, many. And many but, are in the room here today. Yeah, and we have a lot of the co-founders here in the room. So, you know, it's, it's been... Um, and uh, an inspiration to me as a friend, um, I give her more credit than she likes to take for really um, getting me to ask for less permission and more, for, more forgiveness. So, I mean, on this note, we have... An audience here has heard a lot about gender equity, and I worry that people are becoming numb to it and that what we need are bursts of energy to just do a little bit more. 
whenever we have those, that energy and to be kind to ourselves. So um, Katie, you can blow up whatever you want to on this topic, but maybe um, give us a burst of energy. How do you be a male ally? What's one little thing people can do? Give us some inspiration around this. Are you asking the male ally or? Um, male ally okay. or blow it up, wherever you want okay. to start. You want to start? You go. I'll start. <laughs> um, here's the thing. This is not complicated. This is about intention and prioritization. So if you're a founder or a CEO and you, your board is one that is all male or and especially all white male, then don't talk publicly about how much you believe in gender equity or racial equity or anything else. Because you, if, you if you believed in it, if this were a value for you, your board wouldn't look like it does. And if your board does look like it does, and you're starting to think about, shit, I want to start to address this, then take a deep breath, hang a lantern on the fact that you're beginning the journey, and be OK with that. Because we all start from an, a completely, um, you know, uh, just like a very disappointing place. If you're a white person who has any kind of, you know, leadership uh, privilege, any kind of resource, you have to start to think about the ways in which you've inherited that and the ways in which you use that. So begin where you are and then start. So that's the nicest way I can say. And I know we want to create a warm pool, and the warm pool is begin. It is there's many of us out there who are ready to help you and um, create a structure and a set of tactics to get there. Can you give everyone permission to make mistakes? Like, is that something you can do? Yes, you can make mistakes. Of course, we all make mistakes. It's not about that. But I also think you can't just like worry about making a mistake. You have, a, you have tactics for every other business outcome you want to reach. So have one for this part. Because in 20 years, we're going to be a majority non-white country. Forget about the global audience that you have that's diverse. If you don't have boards and leadership teams and programmers and everyone else that look like the world, you're just going to miss a ton of shit. It's just like, it's unavoidable. So, one quick thing I'll share with you, and then our male ally on stage will give his, he'll attempt, he'll, he'll, he'll wade in carefully. Um, <laughs> We have a thing at our company based off of the completely bullshit, and I'm just going to say it, Rooney Rule, okay, that makes a lot of people pat themselves on the back. And that is, although I'm sure many of you know, for the NFL, when there's an open position, you need to, hire, you need to recruit or interview one woman or a person of color for the position that's open. So obviously we know that's ridiculous. Um, and that's not a standard at all. And the fact that it's been celebrated as long as it has speaks to the status quo and its power. That said, my bra is showing, excuse me here. Um, <laughs> the bad robot rule that we created is super easy. Steal it and call it your own. Recruit in, in proportion to the population. So every time there's a job opening or a position on your board, 50% of the people you see should be women, and at least 40%, if not more, should be people of color. You, it changes everything. Always hire the best person, blah, blah, blah. But if you are not having candidates, that are representative of the country and the place and the world that you're living in, then you are absolutely not getting the best of the talent pool that's out there. And I will say that when we started doing this, we made it up five or seven years ago. I don't even know. We're, we're terrible with metrics, so we're bad for this conversation. But we did not have a company that looked like the world. So we changed our recruiting, and our goal was only ever to just make sure that we saw everybody and then get to the best of the best. And I will say that today, over 50% of the leadership of our company are women, that 55% of our company are women, that 48% of our company are people of color right now. And that happened not because we were wringing our hands or worried about getting it wrong, but because we just put something into place. It's just a tactic and it's a process and it will change your business and it will make your culture everything it isn't right now and that it could be and you will be grateful. And, you don't, and then you don't have to be scared. You just have to say thank you a lot. So that's all. JJ, bring us home with some sort of allyship. Try to be funny. It's the last bit. <laughs> Just marry Katie McGrath and it'll all work out. Oh, I, 
I, I, I will just, all I can do is, is echo that and say, you, if you do the thing, if you just start doing it, and to, to be in meetings, it, it makes me emotional actually, to, to be in meetings and to look around and see people who were never on a usual suspects list. They were never people that you would think would normally have this job. They were, they were not people, but they were A, the best people, they were great, and they were there because we made sure they had a shot. And to, to see this company, and by the way, to see how much it means, I can't tell you how many people comment on the fact that our company looks like the world. And, and it's something that, like, you know, we're always trying to figure out what did we screw up lately? How do we fix that thing that we didn't do quite right? And oh God, what? But the truth is to be in conversations, especially when they're about, and we're all talking at a certain point about, about user interface, whether it's a, a, a product, a, a piece of software, a, a film, a show, it's always how does a human interface with the thing? When you have people that don't look like you, whatever you look like, and you're sitting around this table, you are going to hear points of view, especially if you encourage and really, like anyone in this room, I, I think we all forget sometimes the power of our voice. And it's really important to remember, you have to remind people again and again, do not hesitate to call me out. Do not try, don't worry about embarrassing me. Like, be tough, be the, the person that you, you want representing uh, you and your point of view. But to be in a room with people who are suddenly bringing up ideas or issues or things that you, you never would have thought about, it is invaluable and, and it saves you so much money and so much time because you're getting that kind of point of view there at the beginning, the inception of the thing, as opposed to down the line when the thing has been developed and suddenly people are even you know, more reluctant to share their, their point of view or your, your public tells you in a, in a horrible way just how wrong the thing you did was. So I just, I can't tell you how much it's benefited our business by having the people that we have at our company and I could not be more grateful to them and to Katie because I would not have even known how important it was if I hadn't heard it from you. Thank you guys, you guys are incredible. Appreciate you being here. Thank you.